Hey guys, how are you? <clears throat> Wait a few more minutes. How you doing, everybody? Lucas, how are you? We'll wait a few more minutes. DJ, what's up, brother? And pray again by the grace and mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ that it doesn't buffer, that the internet connection stays strong. By the grace and mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ. How's everyone doing? We'll wait a few more minutes. Diego, what's up, man? We'll just wait a few more minutes for the regular show up. May the Father be glorified. May the Lord Jesus be glorified. May the Holy Spirit be glorified through us imperfect vessels and instruments <clears throat> we love you father son of god lord jesus we love you holy spirit we love you have mercy on us father we are broken vessels tainted corrupted by sin by the evil of the world by the influence of satan father heal us by the wounds of jesus christ by the blood of jesus christ cleanse us and purify us father Holy Spirit, sanctify us and transform us to become more like Jesus. Please, Holy Spirit. <clears throat> By the stripes of Jesus, our Lord, we are made whole. <clears throat> we are restored, transformed. <clears throat> and we ask, Holy Spirit, Father, we ask you. Son of God, we ask you. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, we ask in Jesus' name. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, heal us. <clears throat> Transform us spiritually, emotionally, mentally, and physically, Father. Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit, Yahovah Rapha. The scriptures say, you are Yahovah who heals our healer. The Father is our healer. The Son, the Father's heart, is our healer. The Holy Spirit, the eternal Spirit of the Father and the Son, he is our healer. Heal us, Father. Lord Jesus, heal us. Holy Spirit, heal us. I know I need it, Father. Heal me, Lord. Heal me of my imperfections. Save me from my sinful passions. Save me, Father. Not to be a stumbling block to my brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ, even to my enemies. Save me, Lord Jesus, for your glory, not for my praise, for your glory. Holy Spirit, save me from my imperfections, my impatience, my lack of control. Give us the grace to exercise perfect constraint. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Father, we ask, Lord Jesus, we ask, Holy Spirit, we ask you bless this session. Anoint this session. Enable me to recall scriptures and interpret them perfectly without error, without stammering, without confusion. Illuminate me. Illuminate everyone here. Father, illuminate everyone here. Lord Jesus, illuminate everyone here. Holy Spirit, illuminate everyone here. Illuminate them, please, to see the depth of scripture, the beauty of scripture, the power of scripture, the majesty of scripture, because the scripture is the voice of our God. It is the voice of the Father, the voice of the Lord Jesus, the chief shepherd, the voice of the Holy Spirit. Speak to us. Let me disappear. I decrease and the Lord Jesus increase so that all eyes will be focused on Jesus. And Abba, please, Lord Jesus, please, Holy Spirit, please heal me, heal us, heal our loved ones. Heal my daughters and preserve them. Preserve us. Cover us and wash us in the blood of the Lamb, the Lord Jesus, and seal us by the Holy Spirit and destroy distractions of Satan and his children. Please, Abba. Please, Lord Jesus. Please, Holy Spirit. And bless my neighbors that I won't be a stumbling block to them, but they'll hear the voice of Christ speaking clearly. Fill my lungs and my chest and throat with the breath of life and anoint the sound of my voice to be pleasing to your servants, Holy Spirit, to your servants, Lord Jesus, to your children, Father. Use me to glorify you, to glorify Jesus, and to glorify the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' almighty name, Yahovah, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Yahovah, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Yahovah, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. We love you, Abby. And we love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. Okay, folks, uh, I'm going to try something new today. Okay? We're going to wait for the regulars to show up. And thank you for putting up with me. I mean this. Thank you for tolerating and putting up with my imperfections, my weaknesses, because of your love for Jesus. Because I try to be an open book and I want to try something new today. I'm trying to be an open book and I'm trying to be honest and transparent as much as I can. You know what my issues are? You know my imperfections? You know my failures? <clears throat> right? You know I struggle with patience. I struggle with, with anger and self-control and 
I also struggle with sinful passions that I trust Holy Spirit to crucify and destroy and set me free from. And I don't want to be an unnecessary stumbling block, but at the same time, I don't want to be a crowd pleaser. I don't want to tickle your ears so you can love me, and I don't want to offend you. I don't. I want to be honest to the scriptures as much as I can, honest to our God, and speak the truth to the best of my ability, knowing that I'm imperfect. So I'm trusting the Father. I'm trusting the Lord Jesus. I'm trusting the Holy Spirit. So what I'm going to do now is, slowly but surely, I'm unblocking everyone. I'm unblocking anyone. So what I'm going to try to do now, but I need your prayers because I know some people will hate me no matter what, and they'll try to find any excuse to attack me. That's okay. The Lord Jesus have mercy on them. I'm slowly starting to unblock everyone with the help of the mods. So pray for them. Ask the Lord Jesus bless them. All the mods, such as Protestant believer, have so you know we have a lot of mods here. Pray for them, right? They love the Lord Jesus. That's why they help me to help you. So slowly but surely, I'm going to unblock. The only way you're going to get blocked, here's the only way you're going to get blocked. If you blaspheme God, if you blaspheme the Father, the Son, Holy Spirit, or you mock and blaspheme his word, you're going to have to get blocked. But I've told everyone, yeah, exactly, it's longer than Magna Carta, Carta. I've told everyone that the mods, when I say everyone, the mods, if you attack me, that's okay. If you insult me, I don't care. Now, if you want to help others to focus on the topic and not be distracted, then don't bring up irrelevant issues or questions not related to the topic. But I'm trusting the Spirit, and I'm now asking your prayers for me. I want to yield to the Holy Spirit and trust the Holy Spirit to constrain me so that if there's someone who disrespects those wishes, that's it. I'm going to die to it because I need victory. I want to be like Jesus in holiness and righteousness and purity, in boldness and passion and love and patience and compassion. And, you know, I've had multiple brothers and sisters counsel me, one of whom is actually here. I didn't know he was joining me, but he's here, counseling me that I need to try by the power of the Holy Spirit, I need to try by the Holy Spirit to ignore the comments and attacks because God has blessed these sessions. He's blessed us in his mercy with tremendous wisdom and knowledge, depth of scripture. But Satan knows what my weakness is, and he knows how to cause me to stumble. So I go into tangents because I address people. And then those who want to listen are turned off. And I don't want to be a stumbling block to them. Okay? I don't want to be a stumbling block to them. So I'm going to try, guys. Believe me, I am, and I say this, and I'm not... Believe me when I say I'm not trying to appeal to sympathy or pity. I'm not. I don't need your pity. I need your prayers and your fasting for me and my children. Let's be honest. And John Hoodie, God bless you, brother. And sorry for being harsh with you. You meant well. And again, because of my lack of self-control. God bless you, brother. Forgive me for the sake of Jesus. But let me be upfront with you before we begin. The Lord Jesus came to save broken vessels. He came to save human beings who were born into a fallen, broken, corrupt world. A world corrupted by the influence of Satan and his angels. And so whether we like it or not, every one of us are broken. We're either broken because of broken families or circumstances in our life. And that's what Satan wants to do. He wants to break us. He wants to wound us. He wants to hurt us. He wants to destroy us because he hates us. What does Jesus do? Because Jesus is almighty and Satan's nothing but a creature under the feet of Jesus. Jesus comes to heal. Jesus comes to restore. Jesus comes to transform all his broken vessels. Okay? And folks, I'm a broken vessel. One of my best friends, a friend who is more than a friend, he's a brother from my heart, who is a slave of Jesus and loves me for the sake of Jesus, is here. He's joining us. He's right here. He's here. His name is Ed Shaba. Let me just mention some people that frequent my YouTube sessions. You'll see him. His name is Ed Shaba, so pray for him and his family. Uh, Al D is another one, Sahi Christian. These guys are more than friends. They are my brothers from my heart, and they are slaves of Jesus Christ, right? So he's here. 
And oh, Ed is here. I don't know if Ed is here. Ed will tell you, I believe it was in the 90s, where I was blessed to be there, where he preached the gospel of Jesus Christ to his wife, who's his wife now. At that time, wasn't his wife. And she gave li her life to Jesus. And they've been married for over 18 years. And they have four beautiful children. Last time I counted, it was four. One young soldier, a young man, a soldier who's a giant, and three girls. Right, I'm right. Arpa. Last time I counted, it was four. I don't know. You're a baby factor. You may have five. So that was in the 90s. So him and I go way back in the 90s. And he remembers our pre-Christian days. There he goes. Ed Chaba. Yep, four. A young lion, six foot two inches, I believe, and three beautiful princesses who love Jesus because he has a godly wife. He Pre-Christian days, he'll tell you, he's a witness. We were into bodybuilding. He entered a bodybuilding competition. What did you place, Ed? You remember what you placed? This is pre-Christian days, guys. Pre-Christian days. What did you place? Yep, here he is. He'll tell you. Sixth. He was sixth. Now, Ed, if I say, if I tell people, I don't remember, I think, did I train you for that? I don't want to take credit. It was a Mr. Natural Competition Six. He was shredded. I trained you for that because I don't want to say something, right? Yeah, I think so, yeah. And they're all on steroids. I think, was I training you for, I don't remember, man. I thought I was training you, but I don't want to take credit. They're going to say he's an arrogant egomaniac. All right? See? So, guys, when I tell you pre-Christian days, I used to be the bodybuilding. Here he is. He's a witness. Ed Schaub, right there. Right there, man. Now, only thing I lift is pizza slices. I try to at least get 20 reps per slice. But anyway, Ed's been there. See, look, guys, I want you to copy and paste what he said. Renee, copy and paste. I looked amazing. Because at that time, no steroids. We didn't do steroids. I got to a point where my stomach was flat. Didn't have abs yet, and I was 220. He's a witness. Am I lying, Ed? You know we're going to have to answer to the Lord if we're lying. Yeah. And the dude was shredded. The guy was shredded. This guy he had abs, and I started hating on him. Right. So, Renee, I was better looking than your father. That's a, that's a side joke. Anyway. But, guys, anyway, I'm going to try to turn a new leaf. Pray for me, guys. I, and I be on, I'm being honest. I'm trying to be transparent. I want to be an apologist that's as real as possible because I don't want people to make me more than, a, they, uh, than I am. If you make me more than I am, I will disappoint you. I swear I'll disappoint you. Ask Ed. The reason why Ed's my friend for over 20 years is because of Jesus. If it wasn't for Jesus, he'll tell you. I'm not someone you want to be around. Pray for me. I have a lot of issues. And I want healing. I want to be healed so I don't cause people to stumble. I want to be healed so I can glorify Jesus and make him smile. I want to be healed so that Jesus will shine through me. So right now, with the advice of Ed and others, I'm not going to block anyone and I'm not going to attack anyone. Please don't, don't blaspheme God. Don't blaspheme God. That you will get blocked. Do not mock our God. Do not mock the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Do not mock anyone associated with our Lord. His disciples, his blessed mother, please don't do that. You want to attack me? I'm okay with it. And I'm telling the mods, let them attack me. If they say, Sam, you, you are one bald, arrogant, handsome beast. As long as they say handsome, please don't block them. Okay? So don't do that. Right? Now that said, we're going to begin. So slowly but surely, I'm going to be unblocking everyone. I am. And it's not I'm trying to be humble. I'm trying to be honest. Honestly, guys, I'm trying to be honest from my heart. I'm not trying to be something I'm not. I'm letting you know I'm a broken, sick vessel who needs the great physician. We all do. We are broken. And we need the great physician, Jesus Christ. We need his love. We need his healing touch. We need him to embrace us in his arms and flood us in his love. <clears throat> See, I'm being moved in my spirit. I honestly know, know myself. I know my weakness. I am a broken vessel. And I cannot make it without Jesus. I can't. I can't do it, honestly. I can't do it. 
So I'm not trying to be humble. I'm being honest. And one of the reasons why I block people, I'll be honest, I block people so that I don't stumble and sin and get angry and start chewing a person out because I know my weakness. So one way of protecting myself, I block people that I know I won't be able to control myself and unleash. And so I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. So let's let's begin by the grace of God with that as an introduction. And do pray for my healing. I'm on a journey. One thing I beg and I ask the Lord Jesus. This is my prayer. The work you've begun in me, Lord Jesus, complete it for your glory. Do not let me stumble and shame you. Do not let me disgrace you. Do not let me blaspheme your name. And heal me, Lord Jesus, for your glory. So that at the end of my journey, people will know that here was a sinner, a broken and perfect vessel, whom Jesus loved, whom Jesus preserved. <clears throat> Whom Jesus healed for his glory. And I want people to remember me. Here was a man who, though failed Jesus, who, though failed him, <clears throat> his heart, his desire was to love him. That's what I want. I really mean that. I mean it from my heart. I want the Lord to look at me and I want him to smile. I want him to say to me, son, <clears throat> I know you failed because you sinned and you struggled with your sins and your imperfections. But in your heart, you sought to love me. Well done. And to your rest. That's what I want. That's what I want. <clears throat> and I'm not just saying that in front of you. That's what I want. I can't live without Jesus. I can't do it. I can't. Ed will tell you, had it not been for Jesus, I would be I wouldn't be in a good place. Had it not been for Jesus, the things that I've been tempted with, I would have been barred from society. Had it not been for Jesus. But Jesus is alive. He's real and he's almighty. Jesus is alive. He's real and he's almighty. He's real. He lives. And because he lives, he loves us. And he's almighty to save. Okay? Now with that said, exactly DJ, DJ next. The Lord Jesus shine his face on you and your wife and bless you. With that said, let's begin the topic I know I got a lot of heat from yesterday's session and the session before that. I got a lot of heat, man. Ooh, shit. I got a lot of heat. And you know what? I'm just going to let go and trust the Holy Spirit to constrain me. Yeah, thank you, brother. This was good. And, guys, thank you for the super chat. This brother, I had to come. Bento, you know you have perfect, perfect sight. You don't need glasses. He said, Brother Sam, I hope you never have to wear eyeglasses because that would prevent everyone from seeing those sexy eyes of handsome beast. Ah! You're the man, baby. All right. Let's, with that said, let's go into the topic. Was there a question I needed to address? Okay. Hebrews 1.8 and Revelation 1.1. 1, 1. Hebrews 1.8, Revelation 1.1. Roman Catholic, I almost got tempted to delete the sessions because one thing I'm telling you, brother, I am not good at controlling my anger when I get attacked. And criticized and I almost came close to deleting them I said no let it be I'm gonna trust Holy Spirit to constrain me yeah yeah because I, I, I'm telling you guys Ed, Ed will tell you what's my struggle when I get attacked something in me I just the anger arouses and I don't like it I'm, I'm sure that's pride may God save me from it I said no let it be no I won't Anna. I'm not going to delete it I'm just gonna leave it on but I know I'm gonna get attacked Yep, the Jilu. Yep, yep, yep. I know I'm going to get attacked. But with that said, in Jesus' name, let's focus. Let's focus. And Lord, I pray we can, we reach close to 300, Lord, for your glory. We're going to start unblocking everyone slowly. Now, the mods know the only 
way you're going to get blocked. Don't know you're going to get blocked. Oh, man, I know I'm setting myself up for failure. But Holy Spirit constrain me for the glory of Christ. The only way you're going to get blocked, if you blaspheme God, if you blaspheme Jesus, you blaspheme his word, and if you even dare to insult any of the Lord's disciples, his holy servants, especially his blessed mother, you will get blocked for that. You attack, attack me, that's okay. Let him attack me. All right. Now, with that said, let's begin. This is part two of the previous session. This is part two of the previous session. Okay. So, and guys, by the way, since I'm going to let people comment and say what they want, as long as they don't blaspheme, that means if you have a question for me, put at Shemunian, at Shemunian. So I know that you're trying to get my attention because right now I'm going to do my best. Trusting the spirit can stay me. You can do what you want, Sam. You're a fatty, but you're a good looking fatty, Sam. You're, I'm going to shut up. And you can thank brothers and sisters who've been counseling me, like Ed Sh Shaba. He's been counseling me. And I said, All right, I'm going to do what I can. So you got to pray for him and his family. Say, Thank you, Ed, because he's not just one. Multiple people. Remember what I said. When the Lord wants to speak to you, at the mouth of two or three witnesses, he'll confirm something. So multiple people have told me this. And that means the Lord is talking to me. And I'm hoping God will give me the grace to listen. Okay, now let's begin. Hebrews 1, verse 8. If you don't remember the first part, if you don't remember, I need it, Mickey. The first part, then you know what? This part two is going to be a little confusing. Please make sure to listen to part one. Please make sure to listen to part one because I'm going to be building on part one to finish the point. Let me remind you what the objections were. Let me remind you. What the objections were. You guys ready? What the objections were? Here are the objections. Hebrews 1.8 quotes Psalm 45.6. 16.11, good to see you, brother. You're a blessing to my heart. All of you are. It's just I don't see you as much because I know you're busy. Hebrews 1.8 quotes Psalm 45.6. Let's post it back to back. And by the way, mods, if you can help me chip away at the block list, it's so huge. It's more than Magna Carta. Start unblocking so that we can finish list. Now, Hebrews 1.8. Now, you can go to the King James, brother, because that's the New American Standard Bible. Go back to the King James, if you can, because you're quoting the New American Standard Bible. I can tell because they put Old Testament citations in capitals. Oh, is it? Even the New King James Version does that? See? Because I know the New American Standard Bible... When they quote the Old Testament, they put it in all caps. New King James Version does that too, huh? Boy, too many Bible versions out there. I'm confused. But yeah, let's stick with the King James. Remember, the old king is still good. Ain't nothing wrong with the old king so that you need a new king. And if the king ain't on it, the king ain't in it. If it's good enough for Paul, it's good enough for me. Eh, 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 eh. By the way, let me let me real quickly. Do you remember our precious brother, Pastor Joseph al -Gariri? We were the, the uh, three musketeers. We used to do the Jesus or Muhammad shows. It was David Wood, and those shows are archived. David Wood, myself, and Pastor Joseph al -Gariri. Remember, he say, eh, 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 praise the Lord. Eh, 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 eh. If the king ain't on it, the king ain't in it. Eh, 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 eh. Ibn Musaddis. You remember him? Ibn Musaddis. His dad was an Iraqi Shia, and he became a believer in Jesus Christ, but he was... King James only. Did you know that King uh, King James 11, 1611? Ibn Mus said this. He was King James only back then when I wasn't, right? I mean, meaning I didn't think the King James was a perfect translation. And he would say, hey, hey, if the king ain't on it, the king ain't in it. Hey, 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 pray for the Lord. I can't be too loud. Uh, too loud. <laughs> because my neighbors, they think I'm nuts. <laughs> Ibn Musaddis. I don't know how you say Ibn Musaddis. What was it? Ibn Musaddis? Ibn Musaddis. <laughs> All right. I'll tell you something about that guy. Because you guys don't know these apologists behind the scenes. If there's a man who is full of integrity, who loves Jesus from his heart, and seeks to honor the Lord, that's Pastor Joseph el -Gariri. I can tell you, because I've... I've I've been with that man behind the scenes. That's a man 
who loves Jesus, a man of integrity who sold out for Christ. Right? So you can trust that man. He's a man of integrity. Usama Dakdok. No, he's not there anymore, Zina. He's pastoring a church somewhere in Lebanon because, you know, Mushimani, you know, Muslims love him so much they want to reach out and lay hands on him. Usama Dakdok. Guys, I don't, I'm not trying to drag it, but I want to give credit where credit is due and honor the servants of Jesus. Why do I want to honor them? Proverbs 27, verse 2. Let me show you why I want to honor them. Proverbs 27, verse 2. It's in Panos Filippo. I love your name. Charbel, I love your name too, man. Proverbs 27, verse 2. Yeah. Watch here. Candace, how are you? Read here. Thank you, Vino. Read what it says. Let another man praise thee. Let another man praise thee. And not thine own mouth. A stranger and not thine own lips. I want you to remember that passage, Proverbs 27, 2. Let someone else praise you, don't praise yourself. And I want to honor the servants of Christ. Let me tell you what kind of man Usama Dakdok is. Okay. I know apologists, folks. This is true. I'm not lying. I know big name apologists that will charge an arm and a leg for you to invite them to come and speak at your church. I know of a few apologists. Their speaking fee is anywhere from five thousand to ten thousand, and one of them even it's twenty five thousand. He does, Ronnie. I believe he does. Do you hear what I just said? Anywhere from five thousand dollars to ten thousand dollars, and there's even one that when it comes to debates, he'll charge twenty five thousand. You want me there? That's their speaking fee. Osama Dakdok. He is. In full-time ministry, full-time ministry, he depends on the support of the people of God. And he doesn't have a speaking fee when he's invited to go to a church. He just comes and says, if God puts in your heart, give a love offering to the ministry. And he drives from state to state. Let me praise this man. I happen to be at some of his services. He will drive 12 hours, 16 hours, to go to a small church, and I was there. Guys, the, I am a witness to this. I am a witness to this. He was invited in a small church. I don't want to give the location. If there were 20 people, that would be close. I think there was 20, maybe 15. He drove, I believe it was 12 hours, 16 hours, to this place, about 20 people, at most 25. To preach his heart out, showing why Islam is dangerous and Christianity is true. He didn't charge them. He only asked them for a love offering. And he preached his heart out and then drove back all that distance. There goes his website. Protestant Believer just posted it, uh, his YouTube channel. Subscribe to his channel, pray for him, and support him. That is a man who's about the glory of Jesus Christ, not for money. I don't even think they're able to cover his traveling expenses, his gas and his lodgement. Do you know that? I don't even think they're able to cover that because it was a small church. These are the men of integrity who love Jesus. So now with that said, what's the objection? Hebrews 1 verse 8 and Psalm 45 Verse 6. Hebrews 1, verse 8. Psalm 45, verse 6. Let me show you this. What's the objection? Let's go into the... I love your name. But unto the Son, he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. This is quoted about the Lord Jesus Christ, Hebrews 1, verse 8. But Hebrews 1, 8 is quoting Psalm 45, verse 6. Psalm 45, verse 6. There, let's read Psalm 45, verse 6. It says, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of thy kingdom is a right scepter. Okay, now what's the objection? Pay attention because I'm going to repeat the objection and then refute it and demonstrate none of these objections refute the Trinity or the deity of Christ. So are you ready? Psalm 45, 6. Psalm 45, verse 6. 
is, a, is quoted in reference to Jesus Christ. Okay? But Psalm 45, 6 is about the king of Israel. If you read the entire psalm, Psalm 45 is about the king of Israel. Now, depending on which anti-Trinitarian you ask, they'll tell you it's either about David or Solomon. It originally was about David or Solomon. Okay. What do they hope to accomplish by showing you that this psalm is originally about David or Solomon and then applied to Christ? What are they trying to prove? Here's what they're trying to prove. If Jesus is Jehovah God, because Psalm 102, verses 25, 27, is applied to him. Because if you haven't listened to the previous sessions, you're going to get confused. So I'm trying to help you so you don't get confused. But listen and re-listen until it becomes second nature. In Hebrews 1, verses 10 to 12, Hebrews 1, verses 10 to 12, the Father quotes Psalm 102, verses 25, 27, and applies it to the Son. Now, why is that important? Psalm 102, verses 25, 27, the psalmist is praising Jehovah God, and he is describing Jehovah God as the one who created the heavens and the earth, who remains unchangeable, whose years never end, unlike creation, which wears out and grows old. So a psalm about Jehovah being the almighty, unchangeable creator and sustainer of all creation is applied to Jesus. The only way that can be applied to Jesus is if Jesus is Jehovah God Almighty, the eternal, unchangeable creator, sustainer of all creation. Right? And it's the Father applying it to the Son. It's the Father quoting the Psalm and describing the Son in the words of the Psalm. Basically, the Father saying to the Son, You, my beloved Son, you are Jehovah. You are unchangeable. Your years never end. You remain the same, unlike creation, which you created and you sustain with changes. Thank you, Gerson. God bless you. Okay. So how do the anti-Trinitarians try to refute it? Are you ready now for their refutation and so that we can respond? How do the anti-Trinitarians refute it? Are you ready for the refutation? Pray for peace because my neighbor's music is blasting. Whew. They'll say, wait, wait, wait. No, no, not so fast. Psalm 45, 6 is about David or Solomon, and it's quoted about Jesus. So if Psalm 45, which is about David or Solomon, is then applied to Jesus, then using your logic, Jesus must be David or Solomon. You understand what they're trying to say? Jesus is no more Jehovah God than he is David or Solomon. Because a psalm about David or Solomon is applied to him, and yet you won't say he's David or Solomon. So why do you say he's Jehovah God just because a psalm about Jehovah is applied to him? Thank you, Fotis. You understand what their silly objection is? Do you understand what their silly objection is? In fact, let me get the article. I almost forgot the articles, man. See? Too much going on. You were always on my mind. Let me get you an article on this one. You're always on my mind. Tell me, tell me that your sweet love hasn't died. Save this article, folks. Save this article. I'm going to post this article. Save it. Click on it. Upload it. Print it. Study it. Learn it. Use it for the glory of Jesus. This article. It's, on, it's about... Psalm 45. This article is about Psalm 45. Now, at the end of the article, I link to other articles. Please, for the glory of Jesus, click this article, save it, study it, and click on the links to the other articles because I have tons of articles on Psalm 45. Okay, so here's the link again. So, guys, I'm writing this for your benefit, that you can use it for the glory of Jesus Christ. All right? So, with that said, are you ready to refute it? Are you ready to refute the objection? Okay, let's begin. Because I got to finish the, the series, the refutation, so we can talk about other things. Number one, I'm going to repeat. The thing said about the king of Israel, for the most part, are not unique to a particular individual. What do I mean? Let me explain to you what I mean. The king of Israel is an office. It's a position assumed by many. 
So there are things about the king of Israel that are true about anyone who occupies that role, that position. And the analogy I gave in the previous session was this. Imagine president of the United States. See, that's an office. That's a position. And I say the president of the United States is the commander of chief. Well, that's true. But that applies to anyone who assumes that office. So Donald Trump is the commander of chief, right? Barack Obama was the commander of chief. George Bush was the commander of chief. You know why? Because the office of the president of the United States is not an office occupied by one individual. It's an office that, are, that is occupied by many individuals throughout history. Same with the king of Israel. The king of Israel is not just one individual. The king of Israel has been many individuals, starting with David and then his descendants. The only qualification that you had to have to be a true king of Israel was to be a son of David. This is before the, the monarchy was divided into two and there were rival kings. But you get the point, right? The office of king of Israel is not exclusive to one individual. So the things said about the king, his beauty, his majesty, his power, his boldness, his righteousness, these are characteristics that are true of any king, and every king had to have these characteristics and live up to those qualities, or God would depose him, would reject him. Are you with me there? So yes, you can have a psalm talking about Solomon that can be applied to Christ without this implying that Christ is Solomon, because Solomon is not the only king of Israel. And the things said about Solomon as the king of Israel apply to all the kings, and especially to Jesus, who's the ultimate fulfillment of all those qualities. Because all the other kings before him were mere human beings who failed and sinned and were imperfect. But this king, Jesus, was the only perfect human descendant of David, and therefore the only perfect human king. And he's more than human, he was God. So you see why that analogy doesn't work? Yeah, Timothy, it should be, but not to them, right? However, what is said about Jehovah in Psalm 102, 25 to 27, what is said about Jehovah in Psalm 102, 25, 27 cannot be said of a creature. Why? Because those characteristics are true only of God. Only God is unchangeable by nature. Only God is uncreated by nature. Only God created all creation, and only God sustains all creation. These are characteristics and functions that cannot be ascribed to a creature because a creature is not uncreated. A creature changes. Even when we're glorified in our glorified state, we will still continue to grow and learn and change, though we'll be immortal. But no creature can be said to be unchangeable by nature. No creature can be said to be uncreated by nature, then he wouldn't be a creature. No creature can be said to have laid the foundations of the earth and made the heavens by his own hands. Those are things that can only be said of God. Is that clear? Is that clear? So... Although something about Solomon can be applied to Jesus without making Jesus Solomon. What, what they would have in common is that they're both the kings of Israel, but it doesn't make him Solomon. But things said about Jehovah that separate him from creation, that distinguish him from creation, cannot be applied to Jesus if he's a creature. You see the difference? You're comparing apples and pineapples at this point. Right? If I say the president of chief, I'm sorry, the president of the United States is the commander of chief, the commander of chief, and Donald Trump is the commander of chief. That means he's the president. But it was true of Barack Obama. But I cannot say to Donald Trump, at the beginning, O Donald, you laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will wear out like a garment. You will wear them up, roll them up. They will wear out, but you remain the same and years never end. Can I say that about him? Psalm 45, 6, George. Can I say that about him? No. 
But I can say, Commander of Chief, President of the United States, the ruler of the greatest country and the planet, even though many would disagree. But then I can't go on and say, and oh, Donald, at the beginning you were there. You, No, you can't say that of a creature. Likewise, if Jesus is a mere creature, you cannot take a psalm glorifying Jehovah for being unchangeable and eternal by nature, for being responsible for creating the heavens and the earth and sustaining them and apply it to a creature. You can't do that because these are the qualities that separate God from creation, showing he is not a creature. You get my point? So even if Psalm 45 was about Solomon, this doesn't make Jesus Solomon, but it makes Jesus a king of Israel like Solomon because the office of king isn't limited to Solomon alone. It's an office occupied by all the heirs of David who inherited the throne of God given to David on earth. Exactly, Abdullah Man, Hebrews 1, 10 and 12. Now, with that said, let me now look further into the psalm to show you that that psalm may not be about someone other than the Messiah. Okay, now here's where I need you to pay attention because now we're going to move on to the next point. Okay, we're going to move on to the next point. It is not at all certain or clear that the psalm is about any specific king of the past. Why? Because number one, brethren, follow with me. Number one. Nowhere are we told who that king is. David is not mentioned. Solomon is not mentioned. Hezekiah is not mentioned. We are not told who the king is. Are you with me there? So it is an assumption or a guess that the king may be Solomon or David or someone else because we're not told. Number two, not everyone and not every scholar believes this psalm is about some human king that points to Jesus. There are many, even rabbis, who believe the psalm is about Messiah and Messiah alone. Are you aware of this? And I'm going to give you citations from rabbis, rabbinic quotes that say that this is about Messiah and not about someone else. You with me there? So even if I were to grant that it's about Solomon, that doesn't make Solomon Jesus. It simply means that Jesus shares a characteristic that Solomon possessed, rulership. But that characteristic is not limited to one individual. But the problem is, I'm assuming it's about Solomon. Or I'm assuming it's about David. Here's my challenge every one of you. Take a moment to read Psalm 45. Show me where the king is identified. Where does it say this is David or Solomon or Hezekiah or Josiah? It doesn't. Which is why many scholars believe, even the rabbinic Jews... It's not about anyone other than the Messiah. And the reason why many of them think it can't be referring to some human king, it has to be Messiah, the thing said about that king cannot be said of an ordinary human creature. Let me repeat it again. The things said about that king cannot be said of an ordinary human creature. Are you ready for me to unpack that? Let me give you the link. To my article again. Okay, there's the link. All this information is in my article. All the details are in my article. Click on the link and save it. Let's go to Psalm 4511, King James Version. Psalm 4511. Yep, come on, guys. I want to get to 300. We're, getting, we're increasing. Guys, pay attention. Now, here's why I love the King James, the way it renders it. Guys, this is a perfect translation of the Hebrew. Here, notice how the King James renders it. Perfect translation of the Hebrew. So shall the king greatly desire thy beauty, for he is thy Lord, and worship thou him. Yes, the Hebrew word, hishtichava, shecha, can mean worship. Now let me prove to you that here, the queen is told to worship the king, and not simply honor him. Hishtichava, from you know, where we get shacha. It can mean to bow in honor and respect. But I'm going to demonstrate to you that this bowing is an act of worship because the king is more than a human being. He's God in the flesh. Are you ready for the proof? 
But the King James captured it perfectly. Why should she worship him? Because he is your Lord. He is your Lord. Worship him. He is your Lord. Worship him. Now, guys, I'm going to give the link to my article again. Please click on that article. Okay. Psalm 4511. The word your Lord, thy Lord, is the Hebrew Adonai Ik. Adonai Ik. Literally, it's he is your Adonai. He is your Adonai. This phrase, Adonaiic, this phrase is used only one other time. Follow with me. This phrase, Adonaiic, is only used one other time. And it's only used of Jehovah. Did you catch it? This word, Adonaiic, is used only one other time. And the other time it's used, it's used for Jehovah. Who's not getting my point? Isaiah 51, 22. It's all in my article. Isaiah 51, 22. Okay. Isaiah 51, 22. Post it here. Let me see if I can post it here. Thus saith thy Lord, Jehovah and thy God. Thy Lord, Jehovah and thy God. Guess what the word thy Lord is? Here. And I even give you the, the interlinear. Thus saith thy Lord, Adonai ik, Jehovah thy God, Elohe, Eloheik, Elohe, Eloheik. Ik is the singular <clears throat> suffix, your, no, I'm sorry, second person singular suffix, second person singular uh, suffix. Say that five times fast. Second Person singular suffix. Second person singular suffix. Second person singular su suffix. <laughs> May the Lord Jesus bless the sound of my voice to be pleasing to your ears. Okay. Here's what it says in Hebrew, folks. Thank you. Chabad. Thank you. Let me give you the Hebrew. I'm going to give you the interlinear. Okay. Thus saith thy Lord, Adonai Ik. Ik is second person singular Suffix, possessive, second person, singular, possessive suffix. <laughs> anyway, man, I, I suck at grammar. Anyway, Adonaiic, Adonaiic, your Adonai, who is thy God, Elohe, Eloheic. Okay, now let me get you the interlinear. Are you ready for the interlinear? Check it out. Please prove me wrong. Say, Sam, you're a liar. The Muslims are right. They need to shish kebab you for Allah and his messenger. And you'll be one tasty shish kebab. Okay, here you go. Click on that link, Psalm 4511. Do me a favor. Thank God for modern technology and the benefits of modern technology. Click on that link. Go and look what the word your Lord is. Do you see it's Adonai? It transliterates the Hebrew for you. You don't even need to read Hebrew. Do you see it says Adonai? Does everyone see it before I move on? Does everyone confirm it? It's all in my article, but I want you to confirm it for yourself. Okay. Now let me show you what Isaiah 51, 22 says. So you take it. Don't take my word for it. Okay. Isaiah 51, 22. Go here and tell me if it's not the same word, Adonai. Here, do me a favor. Here's Isaiah 51, 22. Can you click on it and tell me if you see the word Adonai? Jehovah is your Adonai. Adonai, Yehovah, Elohei. Do you see it? Can you confirm it? Good. Let me repeat why this is important. This phrase, Adonaiic, guys, this is where you're going to learn meat. You want meat, right? You're trusting the Spirit to fill me, to give you meat for the glory of Jesus, right? Okay. Lord have mercy on you, Lopez. 
right? Okay. The word Adonaiic, the word Adonaiic only appears twice. It's only used twice. One for the king and the other for Jehovah. And you know why this is beautiful? Let me tell you why it's beautiful. Unitarian heretics will tell you the word Adonai is never used, used for the Messiah. And you just busted that lie because they'll admit to you Psalm 45 is about the Messiah, the king. Are you with me there? And there the king is said to be Adonai. So you just refute that Unitarian lie. The king of Israel, who is Messiah, is called Adonai. Here's the link again to my article. Are you with me there? Before I move on. So the king who is Messiah is called your Adonai, Adonai. And yet the Unitarian heretics will tell you Adonai is only used for Jehovah, never of a human. Well, thank you for admitting now that this human king must be Jehovah in the flesh. You just buried yourself and you proved Messiah is the God man. Now, do you see why the queen is asked to worship him? He is your Adonai, therefore worship him. Are you catching it? Another reason why this psalm may not be referring to any mere human, but it must be referring to the Messiah who's the God-man. Are you ready now for the second line of evidence? Another reason why this psalm cannot be speaking of a mere human being. I say cannot, but again, scholars say no, it can, but it's not really addressing that human king. It's now describing the one to come that this king points to. Because the thing said about a mere human here cannot be said without this being idolatry. You cannot simply call a mere human your Adonai, worthy of your worship, and then say this in Psalm 45, 17. Psalm 45, 17. Notice what it says about the king in Psalm 45, 17. Watch here, Ortho Christos, Psalm 45, 17. God speaking, look what he says about the king. I will make thy name to be remembered in all generations. Therefore shall the people praise thee forever and ever. What king would be caused by God to be praised forever and ever? You see what God said? I'm going to cause the people to praise you forever and ever. What mere human king can be worthy of the everlasting praise of the people of God. And how can he be praised forever if he himself doesn't live forever? You see the problem with saying that this is referring to some mere human that points to Christ? So how do we then understand the psalm? Now, I'm going to walk you through this. I'm going to walk you through this, but I need you to listen for your benefit. I'm going to walk you through this, and I need you to listen for your benefit. Okay. If it is speaking of a mere human king, if it is speaking of a mere... No, Tom, it's not mocking the king of Israel. I love you, Tom. I can't say hello, Agba, because Anna growing, my very precious, beautiful sister in Jesus, doesn't like when I say that. No, Tom, Tom, let me try this again. Al Masihu Akbar, Al Masihu Akbar. Tom, this is praising the king of Israel as God's appointed spokesperson. It's not a psalm condemning the king, it's a psalm honoring the king that God has instituted and appointed to rule on his behalf over his people. You're comparing apples and pineapples, Tom. There's not a word of rebuke or threat of judgment in that psalm because this king is not a wicked king. He is the anointed king of God ruling over his people. al Masihu Akbar, al Masihu Akbar, al Masihu Akbar. Salah al Masihu alayhi wa sallam. Okay, I won't do that, Anna. 
Okay, with me there? Everyone getting it so far? Thank you. Say, hey, Dad, he's praising the Messiah. Okay, now, with that said, okay, are you listening? How do we understand the psalm then? There are two ways of understanding it, but I'm going to show you why I think the second interpretation makes sense. Are you ready? There's two ways of understanding it. Number one, it is talking about some mere human king. But because God has designed the entire Old Testament to be a picture of a greater reality, this king, though merely human, is a shadow of the one who is more than human. Are you with me there? So that's why it goes to say things that cannot be true of a mere human king and can only be true of the one that the king is pointing to. So that's one interpretation. That this king is a mere human being, but he's also a picture of the one who's not merely human, who's more than human, who truly is God, Adonai in the flesh. So it addresses him, but then goes beyond him to the one he points to. Okay, the second interpretation says, no, it's not about any mere human king. It's about the Messiah. Okay, now, if you say the second interpretation. Oh, that's what you meant, Tom. Okay, Tom, you got me confused. I thought you're saying that Psalm 45 is condemning the king of Israel. Well, it's not so much speaking of the human to the spiritual as it is speaking of the Messiah, who's the God man. In Isaiah 14. If you take it that it's referring to the human king and then the spirit possessing the king, still the spirit is distinct from the king, whereas the king of Israel is God in the flesh, meaning the Messiah, the true king of Israel. So anyway, with that said, let's come back. Let's now see why some people don't believe it's referring to the Messiah. It's referring to a human king that's a picture of the Messiah. Are you ready to unpack this? Are we ready to go a little further? Okay, let's read Psalm 45, verses 1 to 5. Let's unpack it slowly. Psalm 45, verses 1 to 5. Remember what the two interpretations are. I'm starting to lean towards the second interpretation. It's only about the Messiah, not about any human figure. It's not referring to any human figure. But then we have to explain some of its language. So read with me. To the chief musician upon Shoshanim, for the sons of Korah, Maschil, Okay, here's where you're going to really love the church fathers. Are you ready to fall in love with these great men and women of the church that God raised up to preserve the faith? My heart is indicting a good matter. Oh boy, I'm getting chills. I'm going to unpack Psalm 45 in a minute. A song of loves. I speak of the things which I have made touching the king. See, I'm speaking about the king. I'm writing about the king. My tongue is the pen of a ready writer. Thou art fairer than the children of men. You are more beautiful than all the children of men. Grace is poured into thy lips. Nothing but gracious words come out of your mouth. Therefore hath God blessed thee forever. Gird thy sword upon thy thigh, most mighty. So he's mighty with, the, with thy glory and thy majesty. Folks, everything said about the king is elsewhere said about God in the Psalms and the other books of the Old Testament. The language, he's mighty, said about God. Your glory, said about God. Your majesty, said about God. Elsewhere in the Psalms and in the Old Testament. And I have this all in my articles that I link to and the one article I gave you. But notice how amazing this king is. Look at the description. Look at the description, guys. Okay. Verse 4, and in thy majesty, ride prosperously because of truth and meekness and righteousness. So notice, he is truth. He is meek and he's righteous. And thy right hand shall teach thee terrible things, shall show you marvelous, amazing things, terrible in the sense like mind-blowing things. Thine arrows are sharp in the heart of the king's enemies, whereby, whereby the people fall under thee. Okay, so far what you just read is an amazing description of this king of Israel. Amazing. Okay, but now let's read Psalm 45, 6 to 10. Because we already read 11. Psalm 45, 6 to 10. Sorry, being distracted. Now pay attention, though. Pay attention. Because I'm going to come back to something. Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. Wow, he's also called God. This king is said to be God who reigns forever. 
Thy throne, Elohim, Hebrews Elohim. You are Elohim, and you reign forever. And the scepter of thy kingdom, your staff is a right scepter. You rule in righteousness. There is no wickedness in you. Thou lovest righteousness and hatest wickedness. Can this be said of any ordinary human? All the kings of Israel struggled with sin and imperfection and wickedness. Therefore, God, thy God, also oh, now he has a God over him. He is Elohim, and he has an Elohim over him. Your God has anointed thee. There's that word anointed. And the Hebrew word Mashiach means anointed one. And he's anointed you with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. And in the light of the New Testament, means above your brothers and sisters, meaning your human brothers and sisters that you redeem. That's how the New Testament interprets this. But now watch. All thy garments smell of myrrh and aloes and cassia out of the ivory palaces whereby they have made thee glad. King's daughters were among thy honorable women. Upon thy right hand, now here's where people say, see, it's got to be referring to some historical king. Upon the right hand, pay attention, it stand the queen in gold of Ophir. Oh, there goes the queen again. Sounds like what we were talking about yesterday. If there's a king, there's a queen. Uh-oh, let's not open that can of worms. I'm going to get stoned again. All right. Hearken, O daughter. Now it's talking to the queen. Telling the queen, hearken, O daughter, and consider and incline thy ear. Forget also thine own people. Forget your people and thy father's house. Abandon your father's house for the king. Would you rather be with the king or remain with your people and your father's house or give it all up for the king? Doesn't that sound familiar? Doesn't it sound like what Jesus said? He who loves father and mother more than me is not worthy of me. He who loves sons and daughters more than me is not more worthy of me. Doesn't it sound like what Jesus said? Give up everything, your house, your children, even your life to have me because I'm more precious than all of it. Thank you, magic man. Right? Doesn't that sound like Matthew 19, 28 to 30? You see how it immediately applies to Jesus? So is the queen speaking of a specific, specific historical woman? Or is it speaking of all believers who make up the bride of Christ? Marilyn, that's what we're getting into. That's what I'm, I'm getting into. And I'm going to unpack it. So everyone see how it can be referring to Jesus and not some historical human king in the past that points to Jesus, the Messiah? She's crazy, this lady. These people don't get it that when I joke with David, she just told me, the sister said, why are you praying for the demise of David, for the death of David Wood? Unbelievable. Okay, now, guys, don't you understand? <laughs> oh, boy. Sam, why are you praying for the death of David Wood? You know why I'm praying? So I can get all his uh, subscribers. So I can get all his viewers. So I'm praying for his death. All right, now. Now, with that said, let's pick it up. Are you ready now? We're going to pick it up from 12 to 16, 12 to 16, and show you why you can make a case that it's about Jesus Messiah, not about any human king before him. Read now, and the daughter of Tyre, here's where people get confused. The daughter of Tyre, wait, Tyre is a place by Lebanon, right? The daughter of Tyre, so it's got to be referring to some historical king. Right? Historical king that got married to someone from Tyre shall be there with a gift. Even the rich among the people shall entreat thy favor. The king's daughter is all glorious within. Her clothing is of wrought gold. She shall be brought unto the king in raiment okay, of needlework. The virgins, her companions that follow her, shall be brought unto thee. With gladness and rejoicing shall they be brought. They shall enter into the king's palace. Instead of thy fathers shall be thy children, whom thou mayest make princes in all the earth. Okay, see, this is where people say it's referring to a historical human king who got married to some woman from Tyre. Okay? 
this woman of Tyre, right, became the queen because the king married her. Are you with me there? So that's why people think it's referring to some human king that points to Jesus. But I'm telling you, that's not at all certain. Because this can be a poetic way of referring to the Gentiles being brought into relationship with Christ. How do I know? This can be referring to Gentiles being brought into relationship with Jesus Christ. How do I know? You see the phrase, daughter of Tyre? Okay. You see that phrase, daughter of Tyre? Are you with me here? I got to explain. In the Old Testament, the phrase daughter of a place, daughter of Tyre, doesn't refer to an individual. It refers to the inhabitants of a place. Daughter of Tyre means the inhabitants of Tyre. Like daughter of Babylon means the Babylonians. Here, Isaiah 47.1. Right? Isaiah 47, verse 1. Watch here. Come down and sit in the dust, O virgin daughter of Babylon. Is it talking about an actual virgin? Or is it talking about the inhabitants of Babylon calling them the virgin daughter of Babylon? Sit on the ground. There is no throne, O daughter of the Chaldeans. For thou shalt no more be called tender and delicate. You get it? So daughter of Tyre is referring to an individual or to the inhabitants of Tyre being invited to enter into covenant relations with Christ. In other words, the psalmist is saying that the king will save the nations and make them part of his kingdom. Isaiah 37, 22. Isaiah 37, 22. Watch here. God bless you, family. This is the word which the Lord has spoken concerning him. The virgin, the daughter of Zion, hath despised thee and laughed thee to scorn. The daughter of Jerusalem hath shaken her head at thee. Now, does anyone actually think this is referring to a specific Jewish woman? Or is the phrase daughter of Zion, daughter of Jerusalem, means the inhabitants of Zion, those who live in Jerusalem? No, 47, because you're assuming it's referring to Solomon and that this is referring to Solomon and when he was assisted by the Gentiles to build the temple. This is written after Solomon. And nowhere are we told it's about Solomon. Yes, uh, it's actually Christ for the world ministry. Okay, so do you see that you can make a case? Daughter of Tyre doesn't mean an individual queen. It means the nations, the Gentiles, like the inhabitants of Tyre, are invited to enter into covenant relationship with the king because he desires to save even the nations, not just Israel. And if so, then there is nothing in the psalm that is about some human king. It's referring to the Messiah and him alone, which is why many scholars, even Jews, believe this psalm is about Messiah and him alone. Thank you, brother. God bless you. Are you with me there? Uh, Muslim monotheist. Do you really want an answer to that? Because I made a policy, Muslim monotheist. I'm going to let people bring up objections and I'll ignore them. But do you really want an answer to that? I can answer that for you if you want. But I don't think you're sincere. You don't want an answer. So I'm going to probably ignore you. But for the rest of you, you sure you want an answer? You promise me you really want an answer and you're not here just to ask questions. When I answer, you're going to change subjects. Do you really want an answer? Hold on. Well, Mark, why are you getting upset? Are you his attorney? Did uh, Saudi Arabia send you to represent him? You sure you want an answer, Muslim monotheist? Let me just see. See, guys, I'm doing my best to constrain myself. Pray. I'm yielding to the Spirit, asking the Spirit to help me so I don't lose it because I just want them to attack. Let me just get his confirmation again. 
Okay, Muslim monotheist. One more time, so I know you're being sincere, that you're not lying. Do you want an answer, honest answer? Say yes. Okay, now, if you do, can I finish my point on Psalm 45, and I'll get back to you? Let me finish my point, Psalm 45, and I'll get back to you. Just let me finish this point so I don't change conversation. Okay, you guys heard. He said he wants an honest answer. All right, we'll see. All right, now with the rest of you, do you see how you can make a case? How are you, Sister Maria? Good to see you. You can make a case that Psalm 45 is only about the Messiah and has nothing to do, nothing to do with some human king in the past. You see that? But even if you want to believe it's referring to a human king in the past, let me repeat the two interpretations. The two interpretations, okay, of Psalm 45. Either it's referring to a human king in the past that becomes a picture of the one to come who's greater than him, who's more than human. So there are things said about that human king that can't be true of him, that it can only be true of the one to come who's more than a man, and so this king is a shadow of the one who's the greater reality. Or the second interpretation, it's speaking of Messiah and Messiah alone. Okay? I lean towards the second interpretation. But either interpretation, you still end up with a psalm that stretches human language and goes beyond what can be said of an ordinary human being. Right? Why? Because the entire Old Testament was inspired by God to be a picture of the one who's more than human, who's God in the flesh, and who's the ultimate fulfillment of all these promises. Right? HH, why are you here, friend? If you don't like me, then believe. Okay, now, but now with that said, with that said, how did the rabbis interpret this? This is all in my article. This is in my article. How did the rabbis interpret this? And then we're going to talk about Revelation 1. Unless you want me to address 1 Chronicles 29, 20. I thought I did series on this. Hold on. Let me show you what the rabbis said about this. And I'm going, oh, no, no, I still got more meat on Psalm 40, 45. Hold on. Here you go. Guys, I want you to go to this link. I don't want you to take my word for it. Here's the Aramaic paraphrase. Here's the Aramaic paraphrase of Psalms. This is the Aramaic done by Jews. Done by Jews. Okay? Are you with me there? Here you go. How did the Jews interpret Psalm 45? Click there. See it for yourself. It's in my article, but see it with your own eyes. Click there. And go and see Psalm 45. This is how it begins. Here it goes. How do they interpret it? Here you go. Let me give you give it to you. You ready? Your beauty, O King Messiah, is greater than the sons of men. Bam! In your face, Tobia Singer. Bam! Did you see what? The Jews said about Psalm 45, this is the Aramaic paraphrases done by Jews. They said it's about King Messiah, Melech, right? Mashiach, Baal. Oh, but you know what? You want to get shocked? Do you want to get really blown away? In your faith, thaka. In your faith, thaka. Fucking MC call me Thaya. You remember what Psalm 45 6 said? Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. Look how they interpreted it. Psalm 45 6 says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever, right? Look at how the Jews interpret it. Guys, read. Read Christos. Thy throne of your glory, O Jehovah. The he they in the Aramaic, it's the word Jehovah is forever and forever. Wait, 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 wait. What did you Jews just do? Click on the link and see. You took Psalm 45, 6, speaking of the king, where it says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. 
And you understood that this is referring to the throne of the glory of Jehovah being forever and forever? Wow. Man, what did you do, my Jewish brother? Did you catch it or no? Go to the psalm. It's verse 7 there. Thy throne of your glory, O Lord, Jehovah. And then there's a note. Footnote 30. And this is what it says. What's up, baby? Here you go. God in heaven. Oh, God in heaven. Wait, 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 wait. The Jews who translated Psalm 45 into Aramaic said this is about the King Messiah. And they understood that phrase, your throne, O God, is forever and ever, as a reference to the God of heaven, the God who's in heaven. They took that to mean that this is referring to the God who's in heaven, even though Psalm 45 is about Messiah, the King. What a mark. Mac and beauties. Did you guys catch it or no? Now let me give you another. This is all in my article. Let me show you something else in my article. I quote another source. It's a long one. I don't think I can quote all of it. It's in my article. And I quote, all right, let me show you. This is the... Tahinim, Tahinim, Manhattan. Why do you guys come up with words in different languages? I have a lisp and I have a hard time pronouncing these words. Tahilim, Tahilim, right? Translation and commentary by Rabbi Avrohom Chaim Fior. This is a commentary by a rabbi, Tahilim. And what does he say? Here it is. By a rabbi. And he says. Very nice. Guys pay attention. Tehillim. 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 The song befits the king Messiah. And he quotes the medieval rabbi Radak. Did you catch it? So here is a rabbi who's saying that this was interpreted by a medieval rabbi as King Messiah. Tehillim, 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 Tehillim. Potato, 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 Abdul, potato. Radek is an acronym for a renowned medieval rabbi. You with me there? Is it making sense? Very nice, I like. Let me give you another quote. Okay, let me give you another quote. Hold on. Let me just first confirm. Hold on. Let me see if I... Do I have that quote here? Yeah, I should have it. It may be in one of my other articles. Yeah, I think it's in one of my other articles. Anyway. Yep, 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 yep. Let me find it. Because there is an article where I actually show how this is all combined in one. Let me find it. I got to find that one. So just relax. Don't do it. Where you want to go? Hi, hi, hi. Hold on. Let me find it. I got to find the quote. All right. Let me find it, guys. Just be, be patient, man. Why are you Russian? You're not Russian. You're a Syrian. <laughs> What's going to do? Let me see. Word of Mac. Mac Okay, as I'm looking for it, I'll entertain you. There's a beautiful song. I don't know the words to it. God, my God, I cry out. Your beloved needs you now. And I'm in the mind the makers. Let's see if it's here. Let me find it. Yeah, no, no, that's it. I'll keep the guy. Just be patient. Relax. Don't do it. Where are you going to go? Let me sing that. Up. God, my God, I cry out. Your beloved needs you now. Men is in a minute. In a makers. 
All right, folks. Just be patient now. Come on now. You, what, what else you want? Well, what else you want for your money? Let me find it. I gotta find it. It's here. When a cinema and a makers. Okay, here you go. Save this article too. Here's a here's the other other article. Do you guys like my singing? Here's the other article. Maria, why are you hating, sister? Sister Maria, stop hating. Here's the other article. Guys, can you promise to click these articles and use them, study them, and pass them on? You got it, Sargon. I'll even give you what they call it? Backstage pass, because you're a Syrian. When a sin in the, in the makers. Okay, click on that link. This comes from the article. Okay, the Psalms. I gave you the Psalms, but I'm looking for 1110. In the makers. Okay, here. Here you go. This comes from the Midrash on Psalms. It's in that article. In this particular Midrash, guess what they quote? This is why I wanted to find this. They quote Isaiah 52, verse 13. Okay. Isaiah 42, verse 1. Psalms chapter 2, verses 7 and 8, and chapter 110, verse 1, and Daniel 7, verses 13 and 14, and they combine all of that together as prophesying the Messiah. Do you want me to read it for you? Hater Wood is here because he's jealous that he's decreasing and I'm increasing, right? Do you hear what I just said? This is a rabbinic Jewish exposition. R rabbinic Jewish exposition where they take Psalms 2, verses 7 and 8, chapter 110, verse 1, combine it with Isaiah 52, verse 13, Isaiah 42, verse 1, and Daniel 7, verses 13 and 14, combine them together and say all of those are prophecies of Messiah. Do you want me to read it for you guys? Let me get you the article. Here it is. This is the article. You guys want me to read Because I can't post it all. It's going to be too long. You guys want me to read it? You want to read what it says? Give me a couple ones and I'll say you want me to read it. If not, we'll go on to something else. I'm going to do a part three. Okay. Let me read it for you. Okay. It's in my article. Here you go. I will declare the decree of the Lord. He said unto me, thou art my son. The children of Israel are declared to be sons in the decree of the law, in the decree of the prophets, and in the decree of the writings. Right? In the decree of the law, it is written, thus saith the Lord, Israel is my son, my firstborn. And the decree of the prophets, it is written, Behold, my servant shall prosper. He shall be exalted, lifted up, and shall be very high. Right? <clears throat> and it's also in, Behold, my servant, whom I uphold, mine elect, and whom my soul delighteth. And the decree of the writings, it is written, Sit thou at my right hand until my, thy enemies thy footstool. And it's also in, I saw in the night visions. And behold, there came with the clouds of heaven one like unto a son of man. And he came even to the ancient of days, and he was brought near before him. And there was given him dominion and glory and kingdom that all the people's nations and languages should serve him. Okay, did you catch what it's saying? Now, let me continue. In another comment, the verse is read, I will tell of the decree. The Lord said unto me, Thou art my son. Ask of me, and I'll give the nations for thine inheritance and the ends of the earth for thy possession. Rabbi Yudden said, All these godly promises are in the decree of the king, the king of kings, who will fulfill them for the Lord Messiah. This is the Midrash on the Psalms, who will fulfill them for the Lord Messiah. Very nice. Very nice. I like. It's nice. Woo! Okay. What have we established? What have we established? Psalm 45 may not be referring to any human king after all. Psalm 45 may be referring to the Messiah as being more than man, as being God in the flesh, the two natures of the Messiah. So either way, either way, what's my point? Either way, Psalm 45 does not undermine or refute that Jesus is Jehovah God Almighty in the flesh because in Hebrews 1, verses 10 to 12, the author by inspiration of the Holy Spirit has the Father quoting Psalm 102, 25 to 27. 
a psalm about Jehovah being uncreated, being eternal, unchangeable, who created and sustains all creation, who's separate from creation, superior to creation, and takes that psalm glorifying Jehovah and applies it to the Son and has the Father saying, you, Son, are that Jehovah Almighty. You cannot do that if Jesus is a mere creature because those are qualities that belong to God alone. Right? So we've established that. Now what I want to do, I want to give you some amazing insights, nuggets from the church fathers. Are you ready? Nuggets from the church fathers. I'm writing an article in response to a Muslim. And again, glory to God. I am blown away by the illumination that the Holy Spirit granted the church fathers, these great men and women of the faith, whose writings, not all of them, have been preserved till this day. People like Justin Martyr, Irenaeus, even Tertullian. I'm going to show you what they saw. That today, because of modern liberal critical scholarship, we do not see anymore. Get ready to be blown away. And I was blown away by what they saw. Glory to God. I'm part of that spiritual heritage. I believe I'm born of the Spirit, and these are my spiritual ancestors. If you're born of Christ's Spirit and you belong to Christ, these are your spiritual fathers. Okay. Psalm 45, verse 1. Let's look at it again. Psalm 45, verse 1. But this time with the insights of the fathers. Are you ready? If you want more proof that this is not about any mere human king, but about the God-man, the Messiah, Psalm 45, verse 1, here's what you're not going to see in your translation. Okay, guys, you see it says, my heart is indicting a good matter. Are you guys seeing it? My heart is indicting a good matter. What you do not see is what the Hebrew says. Are you ready? Are you ready? Let me show you something. Here you go. Guys, read with me. The chief musician upon Shoshanim of the sons of Korah, an instruction, a song of the beloved, Yadidot. Yadidot is plural, beloved ones. It can be an intensive plural. But here's what you don't see and what the father saw, an allusion to the eternal generation of the son. My heart is welling forth, bursting with a good word. The literal Hebrew is rachash libbi davar. My heart is bursting forth with a good word. Now let me tell you how the Greek renders it and what the Father saw that we don't see. The meat of Scripture. And you have people who don't even consider looking into their insights because somehow we're smarter than them. We know more than them. Wayne, the Lord Jesus has called me to full-time ministry. Because he's called me to full-time ministry, my attempt, my desire is that the Holy Spirit will fill me to be in Christ's presence day and night and to die to my flesh, to study his word, to learn his word, to love his word, to live his word and proclaim it. And that's where you come in with your prayers and support. Okay, guys, click here. Don't take my word for it. Click there. Can I give it to you again? Exactly. I have to agree with you, Jimmy Aquila. Click there. Timothy, I mean, no, should I stop because no one has officially ordained me? So should I stop now? I mean, is it going to upset you that I haven't gotten any ordin ordination? Okay. If you want me to stop, I'll stop. I mean, if you want, I'll go get ordained. <laughs> it's up to you. By the way, and I'll, I'll share that later. Okay, here, click on that. Click on that. Guys, can you go and come check for yourself? I'm not lying. Okay. Go look at what the, the Hebrew is. I forgot to add the word tob. You'll see in translation, rachash, libbi, davar, tob. The word davar, click on it. That's the Hebrew word for word. Literally, Overflowing my heart is with a good word, a word that is good. A word that is good. Can you click on it and confirm? 
So you don't take my word for it? Let me add the word tobe. See, I knew I was missing something. Darn it. Okay. Tobe. Can you click on it and confirm? Before I move on? Abuna, thank you, Faith. Can you guys confirm? Look at it. It's Rachash, Libbi, even we who speak a Syrian, Libbi, Lev, Lev, Livvi, right? And then it says Davar or Dabar. Dabar is the Hebrew word for word. Don't take my word for it. Click on the lexicon. Tob. Dude, what is what with you, Johannes, and me and Christian Prince? I want to do a live stream with a Christian princess. A Christian princess. No, don't. Captain Ron, did you know what my policy was, brother? We're not going to block people anymore unless they blaspheme God, then block them. I'm turning a, tu a new leaf. Now, Johannes, I want to do a live stream with a Christian princess, a woman who loves Jesus, in love with Jesus, spiritually beautiful and physically beautiful. I want to do a live stream with her. She can be my partner and she can bear my children because we need more Sam Shamoons in the world. Don't you agree? I'm just kidding. Okay, now Orthodox Christians, are you ready to say hallelujah? Kiri eleison? Are you guys ready? You know why? Because you guys go exclusively with the Greek versions of the Old Testament, right? Are you ready, Orthodox Christians? You want to see what the Greek version says? And this is what the church fathers used. Thank you, Patriots. I appreciate it. Here you go. My heart has uttered a good word. He cardia mu logon agathon. Logon agathon. My heart has uttered a good logos. And guess what the church fathers did? The church fathers used that to speak of the eternal begetting of the Son, that Jesus is the good word who sprung forth from the very bosom heart of the Father. <whistles> Mercy. Did you know that? You don't believe me? It's going to be a miracle, but let me give you the links. Because I know you're a bunch of skeptics. You little skeptics. Tertullian. Tertullian. I can't quote all of it, but I'll give you the link. There it is. Tertullian quoting Psalm 44, 2 of the Septuagint. I'll give you the link. Pay attention. You ready? Let me quote it for you. It's going to be in my article. This is Tertullian. In a peculiar, in a way peculiar to himself, from the womb of his own heart, even as the Father himself testifies, my heart says he has emitted my most excellent word. And he's talking about the generation of the son. And he quotes Psalm 44, verse 2. Tikanis kesikala ere. What do you make? What do you make? You guys, can I give you the link? Let me give you the link so you can read it. Hold on, let me give you the link. Man, more than markers. Here's the link. It comes from Tertullian. It's too long. I can't quote it. Against Praxius. Against Praxius. Right? Against Praxius. I'm going to give you the link. You can go see. It's chapter 7. Here you go. Please don't take my word for it. I don't trust myself, so please don't trust me. Man, what do you make? Here you go. Did you catch it? There goes the link, guys. Did you catch it? God bless you, Sharad. May the Lord protect you. Here you go. But wait, there's more. This is not the only one. Let me give you other quotes. What a merc, man. This comes from, let me show you who. St. Cyprian. Treaties 12, book 2. Let me give you the relevant quote. St. Cyprian. Look what he says. Oh, man, this is beauties. Here's the link. 
St. Cyprian, folks, watch. And I just found out that he also confirmed Jesus is the arm of the Lord in the Old Testament. Okay, here. Well, let me show you what he says. If you go to that link, look at chapter 3. It says that's the same Christ is the Word of God. But in chapter 4, he has an entire section, paragraph, that Christ is the hand and arm of God. Folks, be blown away. Just a week ago, I demonstrated Jesus is the arm of the Lord in the Old Testament. To my surprise, I found out Cyprian, long before I was born, also argued from the Old Testament that Jesus is the arm and hand of God, showing you that what we're discovering, they already saw by the power of the Holy Spirit. <whistles> what a merc. And then in three, look what he says, guys. What does he use for the eternal generation of the Son, you haters? Bunch of haters, man. Here, here you go. Look what he says. Thank you, Wayne. In the 44th Psalm, which would be Psalm 45, my heart has breathed out a good word. I tell my works to the king. Wait, 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 wait. Cyprian, you're saying that statement in Psalm 45, 1, which in the Greek is Psalm 44, verse 2, where it says, my heart has uttered a good word. That's referring to the logos in the bosom of the father brought forth without severing from him. Yes. What do you make, man? What do you makers? Did you catch it? Okay, final one. Final example. Final example. What do you mean? What do you mean, man? This is going to be my rebuttal to this Muslim who perverted the Quran to a shame. And by the way, in chapter 5, Cyprian says Christ is the angel and God. Notice Cyprian, long before we were born, said in the Old Testament, the hand of God, the arm of the Lord is Jesus. In the Old Testament, the word begotten from the Father's heart is Jesus. In the Old Testament, that angel of the Lord, who is God, that's Jesus. He was already saying these things long before you and I existed. <whistles> what are your makers? Now notice what Novatian says. Novation, Novation, Novation. <whistles> Treatise concerning the Trinity, chapter 13. I'll never turn you, friend. Am I boring you guys with this? Are you guys getting meat? No, it's not accurate, Johannes. If Jesus didn't have a human spirit, then he does not redeem human spirits. He does not redeem what he has not assumed. No, that's wrong, Johannes. Okay, Wagu. Johannes, I answered you. A lot of snack bars, uh, Johannes. A lot of snack bar. I eat a lot at the snack bar. Okay. Did you guys get the link? Okay. If you got the link, let me quote what he said. Let me quote what he said. Man, what are you makers? There you go. He's taught about the eternal generation of the word. Look what he quotes, you sinners. Sinners saved by grace. Look what he quotes, you sinners saved by grace. Are you ready? My heart has emitted a good word, which word he subsequently calls by the name of the king and Frenchly. I will tell my works to the king. Did you catch it? Novatian, Novation, St. Cyprian, Tertullian, all use Psalm 44, verse 2, to show that Jesus is the Logos, Agathos Logos, the good word in the bosom of the Father, who sprung forth from the Father while severing from him. <whistles> what a mech! Do you see how much meat there is in Psalm 45? Thank you, Joe Sharp. Lord bless you. Who would have thunk it that Psalm 45 would have so much meat pointing to Jesus as the God-man, as the eternal word dwelling in the heart of the Father? And by the way, I don't know if you caught it. Let me show you what the Greek says. One more time. Psalm 44 in the Greek, Psalm 45 in the Hebrew. I don't know if you caught it. Let me show you what it says, verse 1. I only quoted verse 2. So I'm trying to give you meat and entertain you, not bore you at the same time. Watch here. 
That's why I'm doing the whistling. Here's the first part where the Greek captures it. Guys, can't, read with me. Read with me, folks. Here you go. For the end, for alternate stra strains by the sons of Corp instruction, a song concerning the beloved to Agapitu. To Agapitu. This song is of the beloved. And who's the beloved? Jesus Christ. In the New Testament, the Greek New Testament, Jesus is called the Agapitu of the Father. I like what my Nubian princess said, Magdalene G. Imagine if Sam was the pastor of a church. It would be packed out every Sunday. See, here you got a Christian Nubian princess, my Nubian queen. Irie, Irie, man. What's heresy? I have no idea what you're talking about. Wayne, why are we attacking, brother? Can we, can we focus? Can we all get along? Where's the love? Johannes, you know I love you, brother. I'm talking about Hebrews 1.8. You want to talk about Christian Prince. You want to talk about David Wood. You want to talk about Jesus' as human spirit, the Book of Enoch. You also want to talk about COVID-19. Let's talk about COVID-19. See, I'm being nice, guys. I'm not getting angry. I am not bouncing anyone. Let's talk about COVID-19. Let's talk about Joe Biden, how he's losing his memory. Let's talk about everything but the subject, Johannes. And he happens to be a Syrian. That's right. That's right, Magdalene, my Nubian princess, queen. Iri, Iri, man. Iri, man. What you say, man? Iri, Iri. I'll never turn you, Frank. Now, I'm trying to fight it, Ortho, honestly. I'm trying, by the grace of God, to exercise self control. Okay. Yep, it's for Psalm 45 in the Greek, then the Hebrew Psalm 40, uh, Psalm 44 in the Greek. But in the Hebrew, it's Psalm 45. Okay, now, everyone clear? Do you see how Hebrews 1.8 does not prove the anti-Trinitarian argument? Was that clear? Was that clear? Exactly, Marilyn Murphy. I'll be the Incredible Bulk. See here, look, Marilyn Murphy. It's like Incredible Hulk. Mr. McGee, don't make me angry. You won't like me when I'm angry. Listen, you won't like me when I'm angry because then my pecs will be bouncing. I never turn you, Frank. I may what I could on the side, but I'm loyal to you, Frank. Okay, before I move on, did everyone understand how Hebrews 1.8 does not refute the fact that Jesus is being praised and glorified by his father as being Jehovah God in the flesh. Was that clear? I want it to be, actually. You can ask Ed Shab, I'll tell you. Was that clear? Angelos, I was actually planning to. Angelos, Ed Shab is here. He'll tell you. Pre-Christian days, I wanted to be a bodybuilder, kickboxer, and use that to enter into Hollywood. I wanted to be Jilu Lee, right? Be water, my friend. You feel very much at home here, Mr. Opa. Why are you so apprehensive? Mr. Opa, don't cut me. Kick me. Kick me. What was that? An exhibition? Weird emotional content. Does anyone know where that's from? That's from Enter the Dragon. And then uh, what, what I wanted to do is I also wanted to enter, like, start doing these Arabic dances. All right. Man, I can throw down. All right. If everyone got that, are we done with Hebrews 1.8? Because if we're done with Hebrews 1.8, I could go to Revelation 1.1. 1, 1. You know what they told me, Ortho Christos? I don't know if it's true. Some people told me that I actually stole the series with Halal Hogan and the Sheikh. I don't know if that's true. Did I? That's why I'm hated. Guys, that's why I'm so hated. Because charisma oozes out of my pores and out of my nostrils. I got charisma just oozing even out of my nostrils. Right? Anyway.
If we're done with Hebrews 1 8, can we go to Revelation 1 1? Unless you have any questions. If there's any questions on Hebrews 1 8, if you don't understand the response, let me know because I want to end it with Revelation 1 1. Johannes, do you see what he just did, Maria? Do you see what my Assyrian brother Johannes said? He said, You need to find you an Assyrian wife ASAP. Johannes, I'm in the situation I'm in because I did find an Assyrian wife. And she shake and beck me, brother. Brother, she beck at me. Because if she beck at me, I haven't seen my girl since June. Why would you wish such judgment on me? Why do you wish judgment? I thought you love me. She beck at me, brother. She shake it in the beck at me. She make me shish kebab. If anyone tells me marrying a certain woman, I know that they're wishing judgment on me. That's what I am. I'm sorry. I, don't get me wrong. I love my Assyrian sisters. I do. I love my people. One thing I, I want to say from my heart, I love my Assyrian people. I love them. Right? But unfortunately, I've had bad experiences with Assyrian women. I have. And it's probably because of my attitude. Right? But the one I marry, I'm going to do the Assyrian uh, accent. The one I marry, she shake at me, brother. She beck at me and my mother. Pshilla dai. In Assyrian, we have a saying. Pshilla dai. Pshilla dai means she beck at my mother like no other. Oh, yes. All right. Yeah, it wasn't all right. Okay, are we ready for Revelation 1 1? Jimmy Aquila, make sure you have life insurance. Make sure you've got a psychologist already lined up for counseling sessions, Jimmy Aquila. And make sure, right, you have – I'm just going to go ahead. Poor guy. <laughs> okay. Let's go to Revelation 1-1. Poor guy. You shake at me. Renee, I'm better looking than your dad, all right, Renee? Renee, Renee. Irie, Irie, man. Irie, where's my Nubian princess? What's up, Magdini? My Nubian princess, Ari, Ari. Yeah, man. Yeah, man. Oh, yeah, man. Yes. Come back to Jamaica. What's old is what's new. We'll join you to join us. Our new island home. Okay. Ari, man. Ari, Ari. Jamaica, man. Shaba. Shaba. No, I'm just saying, I know you're not. You're African British. Okay, guys, let's begin. I just wanted to lighten up the atmosphere, get you guys laughing a little bit because we're going to do Revelation 1 1. Roman Catholic, my sincere condolences to the family. I will send a wreath to the funeral service. Okay, Roman Catholic, you said your friend is marrying an Assyrian woman? Let me know where I can send the wreath to for the funeral services. My sincere condolences for their loss. Okay. Okay, folks. Now, with that said, you don't need me to go any further in Hebrews 1. You don't need me to go any further in Hebrews 1, 8. Did I cover it? Or is anyone confused? Let me know. Say, Sam, I'm still not getting it. If you got how Hebrews 1, 8 does not undermine Jesus being Jehovah God in the flesh, I'll go to Revelation 1, 1. Okay. Nobody? Everyone got it because I'm just taking come on to lighten up the atmosphere, all that meat, because we got to finish Revelation 1 1. Okay. If everyone got it, let's go to Revelation 1 1. Lord willing, I will have a QA. I may do a QA tonight or tomorrow. Lord willing, next session will be a QA. It may, maybe not tonight. Tomorrow I'll do a QA. Okay, let's read. Okay. Eddie said he didn't get it. Help me to help you. What part was hard for you, Eddie? What part you didn't understand? Because I don't know if you've been listening from the beginning and if you listen to part one. So let me know what you're not getting. Because you have had to have heard both sessions for this to make sense. If you're just coming in and haven't heard the entire discussion, then you need to go back, listen to part one and two. And if you still have listened to part one and two and still confused, then I can help you. Have you heard both sessions? Oh, you haven't watched from the beginning? A lot of snack bar, Eddie. Don't ask me to help clarify if you haven't listened from the beginning. A lot of snack butt. Revelation on one it is. Let's go. You like that, huh? First and last. 
she 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 shaked me and beckoned me. She beckoned my mother. There's an Assyrian saying we say, Pshinla die, Abshil to die, meaning my mother, she's big. Okay, Revelation 1 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. Okay, let's post it one more time so you understand what the objection is. One more time so we understand what the objection is. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass, and he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. Okay, what's the objection? Here's the objection. Aha, I got you. Jesus is not Jehovah God. Why? Because God gave him revelation. If Jesus is God Almighty, he's omniscient, he knows the revelation, he doesn't need to be given it. The fact that God gave him revelation shows God knows more than Jesus and Jesus isn't God. You understand the objection? You understand the objection now? Revelation 1, 1, it says, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him. Why would Jesus be, be given revelation? Why does he need to be given revelation if he's all-knowing equal to God the Father? See? Proof he's not God. You understand this silly objection? So if you're ready, we're going to unpack and refute it. Are you ready for the refutation? I like Anna. She's got that fiery blood in her. Right? Okay. Now, is this saying God gave Jesus revelation he did not have? Is it saying that Jesus received information he did not know? Thank you, Sarah. God bless you, sister. Wow, a precious Assyrian sister who blessed me. Thank you. I need more Assyrian sisters to bless me. God bless you, sister. All right. Is that what it's saying? Is it saying Jesus was given information he did not know? No, that's not what it's saying. This is where we need to be biblically literate and ask the Holy Spirit to guide us to understand Scripture and not let heretics pervert Scriptures to their shame. That's not what the verse said. Let's reread it one more time. To understand what it's saying. To understand what it's saying. Revelation 1, 1, chapter 1, verse 1. Let's read it to understand what it's saying clearly. Okay. The relation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants. See, this is what they don't quote. They quote that part where it says, Revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him and stop. No. It doesn't stop there. Pay attention to the language. This is the language of mediation, right? This is the language of agency, mediation. Read it carefully. The relation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants. What this is saying, and this is where you're going to need to learn your theology. You're going to need to learn the biblical basis of the Trinity. What the Bible teaches about the Trinity and the roles of of the persons of the Godhead, how they interact with one another and in relation to us. It's not saying he was given revelation. No, he was given the revelation to give. In other words, it's saying when God wanted the revelation to be made known, he made it known through Christ. It's not procession. No, it's mediation, meaning all of God's graces, all of God's blessings, all the knowledge and revelation of God comes through Christ by his spirit to us. That's all it's saying. It's saying this revelation that God gave to us, right, comes from the Father through him to us. Meaning it was the Father's will for the Son to make this revelation known to us by the Spirit. That's all it's saying. It's what we call the concept. The, the concept of agency mediation. Christ is the mediator that mediates all of the blessings from God to us. In other words, no blessing, no gift, no revelation can come to us apart from Christ. Whatever the Father wants us to have, it comes to us because of Christ, through Christ, by the Spirit. That's all it's saying. And I'm going to prove that to you. It's not saying Jesus is not omniscient. Exactly, Orthochristos. 
No, let's read it one more time. Revelation 1.1. Let's read it one more time. And I'm going to prove that's what it's saying. I'm going to prove it to you. I'm going to prove to you that Jesus is omniscient God. But just let me first unpack it. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show. Why did he give it to him? It's not he gave him something he didn't have. In other words, the father appointed the son to make this revelation known. See, the key part is the second line. To show his servants. So the father appointed the son to reveal this to his servants. That's all it's saying. Exactly, Hafsa. Are you getting it there? I'm going to prove to you that the Holy Spirit is involved as well. It's from the Father through the Son by the Spirit. So what this is saying is the Father appointed the Son to make this revelation known to us by the Spirit. Now let me show you the role of the Spirit. Are you ready? Revelation 1.10. Where is the Spirit in this triune activity? Revelation 1.10. Watch. I was in the spirit. Oh, there he is on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. Now let's read verse 11 to see what the voice told him and whose voice was it. Verse 11. Watch. Saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and last, and what thou seest, write in a book, and send it unto the seven churches, which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, and unto Smyrna, and unto Pergamos, and unto Thyatira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. Did you catch it? Did you see what it's saying? I was in the Spirit, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, I was allowed to see heaven, see Jesus, and hear his voice. You see the Trinity again? Nothing is done. That's not an act and work of the Trinity. You, you see it? Notice how the Godhead always work in union and they never work apart from the other. The Father appoints the Son, make this revelation known to them, Son. And the Son then sends a spirit to enable John to then receive this revelation and write it down. Exactly. Welcome to the wonderful world of the Trinity. Now, whose voice did he hear commanding him to write? Whose voice did he hear by the Holy Spirit allowing him to see and hear the voice? Revelation 1, 17 to 19. Watch. It's gonna, I'm almost done. It's so easy to refute anti-Trinitarian doctrines. And when I saw him, the, meaning saw the one whose voice right, spoke, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he lays his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and last. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. I was dead, and I am alive forevermore. And have the keys of hell and of death. Write the things which thou hast seen. Did you catch it now, what it means? The Father appoints the Son to make known this revelation. A relation that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit share in common. And when the Son shares this revelation, he does so by the Spirit being sent to John to enable John to hear the Son and see the Son and write down what the Son wants him to hear and receive. Thank you, Maftihi. Ephesians 1.3 captures it perfectly. Ephesians 1.3. Blessed be the God and Father, Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with every spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. No, all uh, Jimmy, the ones who brought this up were so-called Christian heretics. I think it was a Jehovah Witness. It wasn't just Muslims. It was a Jehovah Witness that used this against me just recently in the comment section. Okay? Let me again show you where the Holy Spirit is in Revelation, that it's a work of the Trinity. It's the Trinity making this revelation known. Revelation 1.10 you read. Now let's read Revelation 4, verse 2, but we're going to read verses 1 to 3. Revelation 4, 2, but we're going to read verses 1 to 3. Yeah. After this, I looked, and behold, the door was open in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, come up, 
to heaven, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. Now notice it says, come up to heaven, right? How did he go up to heaven? Notice verse 2. And immediately I was in the spirit, and behold, the throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. Did you catch it? God told me to enter heaven. So he opened the door. He removed the veil to the spiritual dimension, heaven. And immediately by the spirit, I entered. The spirit took me to heaven to see God the Father visibly on the throne and see Jesus as a lamb and to then see and hear what took place in heaven. Yes, Jesus is king. I would. I would recommend it. Yes, happy-go-lucky. That's an excellent analogy. But remember, everything breaks down. Nothing's identical to God. Okay, everyone get it? Everyone understand the work of the Trinity and making this revelation known? Here's another one. Revelation 21.10, but we're going to read 9 and 10. Revelation 21.10, we're going to read 9 and 10. I hope this was a blessing to you guys and you're not getting tired. Pray God energizes me spiritually, emotionally, mentally, physically. I am tired. I get tired faster than I used to be. I'm not getting young, folks. I'm 48. Okay. Revelation 21, 9 and 10. And there came unto me, and there came unto me one of the seven angels, pay attention, which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, I will show you, show thee the bride, the lamb's wife. So he's saying, Come with me, I'll show you. Now notice verse 10. Verse 10. And he carried me away in the spirit. Notice. For him to go with the angel, the Holy Spirit had to enable him to do so. In the Spirit, which means by the Spirit, because of the Spirit, I was able to travel with the angel and see what the angel wanted me to see. Let me show you again the other places where the Holy Spirit appears. So the Revelation is a book glorifying the triune God and how the triune God works together in perfect, inseparable unity. Okay, Revelation 14, verse 13. Let me show you the, the spirit in Revelation. We focus a lot on God and Jesus in Revelation, but how many people focus on the spirit being the source, enabling John to see these visions and hear these voices and write them down? Okay, Revelation 14, 13. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Write, blessed are the dead, which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the spirit that they may eat from their labors and their works do follow them. Rest from their labors, rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. Yea, saith the Spirit. So who's speaking to John? The Spirit. Who's working in and through John and enabling John to see heaven, to see God, see Christ, see angels, hear their voice and write down the revelations? The Spirit. The Spirit, right? And at the end of every warning... To every church, the Spirit speaks. Every time the Lord warns a church, the Spirit speaks. Right? What does Revelation 2 7 say? Watch here. Revelation 2 7. Before the rapture. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Did you see who's talking to him? The Spirit. If you have an ear, in ear, hear what the Spirit is saying. But wait, I thought it was the Father speaking to you, John. Yeah. And you saw the Father on the throne visibly, yes. And I thought Jesus is speaking to you, John. Yes. And I thought you saw Jesus visibly appearing in various forms to denote various spiritual characteristics. Yeah, that's true. But I also thought an angel speaking to you. Yeah. And now the spirit? Yes, all of the above. I'm a Trinitarian. Hello. Are you catching it? Revelation 3.6. I'll just give you a few more. We're done. Revelation 3, 6. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Do I need to give you more? Or do you think this is sufficient? Sufficient to show the Trinity in Revelation. 
Yeah, the bride is speaking of the inhabitants of heavenly Jerusalem, those who dwell in heavenly Jerusalem, the citizens of heavenly Jerusalem speaking with the spirit and inviting us to join them. Yeah, that, that, yeah that, the, forget the cult, Jesus is king. Just forget them, please. Please don't waste your time. Okay, now, do you understand what Revelation 1-1 does not mean? You understand what Revelation 1-1 does not mean? Do you understand it does not mean Jesus was given revelation he did not know? He was given information that he did not know before he received it. Do you understand that's not what it means? Because I'm going to give you a final proof that Jesus knows everything and knows everything that the Father knows. But do you understand what? So in other words, folks, after today's session, you'll be able to refute this, right? So if an anti-Trinitarian mentions Revelation 1, you can refute it, right? No, 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 no. Finish the verse. That's not what it means. Because what's my purpose in these sessions? Not only for you to hear but understand your Bible, and not only understand it, but by the power of the Holy Spirit, preach it accurately, proclaim it accurately, and not only preach it, but then to live it out as an expression of your love for the triune God. And I pray that for all of us. Right? Okay. Now, let me put the icing on the cake, and we'll be done tonight. Icing on the cake. Icing on the cake. Do you want proof that Jesus is the omniscient God Almighty? That he's Jehovah in the flesh and therefore he's omniscient. He knows everything. From Revelation. You ready? Jeremiah 17 verse 10. And we're done. Pray for me. The Lord keeps sustaining me, energizing me. Jeremiah 17 verse 10 and we're done. Poor Anna. Now read Anna and everyone else. Read. God is speaking, Jehovah speaking. I, the Lord Jehovah, search the heart and try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. Now, Protestant, what I'm going to ask you to do is I'm going to ask you to quote this lengthy section, but before you quote, follow me. You're going to quote Revelation 2, 18 to 23, and then right away put Jeremiah 17, verse 10. Sarah, God bless you, sister. You're an Assyrian? We got to meet, sister. You're blessing me. Unfortunately, from my experience, most Assyrian women... They've been punishing me, <laughs> starting from my poor mom to my not-so-poor sister, and then my ex-wife. Okay, Revelation 2, 18 to 23, and then 17, verse 10. Revelation 2, verse 18 to 23, and then 17, Je Jeremiah 17, verse 10. Guys, read with me. Read. Who's speaking? Revelation 2, 18 to 23. Who's speaking? And unto the angel of the church in Thyatira write, Who's speaking? Got to catch it. And unto the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things saith the Son of God. Who's speaking? The Son of God. Who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. Now the Son of God is speaking. Go back and read 18. You got to read it. The Son of God is speaking. I know thy works and charity, meaning love. I know your love. I know what you're doing. I see what you're doing. And I know your service and your faith and thy patience and thy works. And the last to be more than the first. You've done more works now than you did when you first started. But now notice what he says. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess to teach and seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. Unto idols. Now watch here. Okay, read. Go back and read, folks. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. I gave Jezebel time to repent, but she's so wicked, she doesn't fear me and refuses to repent. So what am I going to do, do to her? I, the Son of God, what am I going to do to her? 22, notice 22. Behold, I cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery, meaning spiritual adultery, with her into great tribulation. I'll bring trials upon them, except they repent of their deeds. Now notice 23, what the Son of God says. And I will kill her children with death. It's not done about little children. It's not about spiritual children. Those who follow her, believe in her, who then <clears throat> obey her teachings. Her spiritual children. I'm going to strike them dead. And when I do, Son of God speaking, all the churches shall know that I am he, I the Son of God am he, which searcheth the reins and hearts, 
And I will give unto every one of you according to your works. That's what the Son of God said. But now pay attention to Jeremiah 17, 10. I, the Lord Jehovah, search the heart and try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. Hmm. Now do me a favor, Protestant. Sorry, bro, to tire you out. Post Revelation 2, 18, Revelation 2, 23, and Jeremiah 17, 10, back to back. Revelation 2, verse 18, chapter 2, verse 23, and Jeremiah 17, verse 10. Let's see who's speaking. Okay, and unto the angel of the church in fire, Tyrite, these things saith the Son of God, with his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. And I will kill her children with death. I, Jesus, have the power to strike people dead and make them alive. I have power over life and death. Who do you think you are? Only God has that power. I will kill her children with death. And all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the reins and hearts and will give unto every one of you according to your works. But wait, Jesus, son of God. That's what Jeremiah quotes Jehovah saying. Jeremiah 17, verse 10. I, the Lord, Jehovah, search the heart. I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. Why does Jesus, the son of God, take the words of Jehovah and apply it to himself? Jehovah says, I am Jehovah that search the hearts and I test the reins, the inner thoughts, even to give to every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. Then Jesus comes and says, then the churches will know that I am he, the son of God, who searches hearts and tests the minds, the reins, and I repay everyone according to the fruit of his doings. Jesus, why are you taking the words of Jehovah in Jeremiah 17, 10 and applying to yourself. And why are you, Jesus, saying from heaven you have the power to kill people dead that deserve it, to strike them with illness, or to heal them and give life when only God in heaven has power over life and death? Why are you claiming these things, Jesus, Son of God? Okay, now, for a treat, we're going to end it with the Jehovah Witness Bible. We're going to end it with the Jehovah Witness Bible for a treat. How does the Jehovah Witness Bible read, folks? Now, again, Protestant, we're done right after this, I promise, man. God bless you for your endurance and preserve you and your family. We're going to read from the Jehovah Witness Bible, Revelation 2, verse 18, Revelation 2, verse 23, and Jeremiah 17, verse 10, in that order. Jehovah Witness Bible, Revelation 2, verse 18, Revelation 2, verse 23, Jeremiah 17, verse 10. Guys, read Jehovah Witness Bible. Read. To the angel of the congregation of Thyatira, write, These are the things that the Son of God says, The one who has eyes like a fiery flame and his feet are like fine copper. And I will kill her children with deadly plague, so that all the congregations will know that I am the one who searches the innermost thoughts and hearts, and I will give to you individually according to your deeds. Joe Witness Bible, Jeremiah 17.10. I, Jehovah, I, Jehovah, am searching the heart, examining the innermost thoughts, to give to each one according to his ways, according to the fruitage of his works. End of story, folks. Even in the Jehovah Witness Bible, Jesus speaks as if he's Jehovah God of Jeremiah 17, verse 10. Did you catch it? Even the Jehovah Witness Bible, the Jehovah Witness Bible, has Jesus taking the words of Jehovah and Jeremiah 17, 10 and applying it to himself. So guys, let me ask you a question. Jehovah searches the hearts of every creature and he tests the innermost thoughts of every creature. And then he's able to repay you according to what you deserve. And he repays you perfectly. What kind of attributes must Jehovah have to know your exact thoughts, your exact desires, in order to be able to then repay you perfectly for what you deserve. What kind of attributes must Jehovah have? He must be omniscient. He must be omnipotent, omnipresent. Why? Because he must know all thoughts, all desires, all inclinations, all deeds simultaneously 
And today, that's about 7 billion people. And then he must be able to then remember what each individual has ever thought, said, and done to repay him perfectly and not misjudge him and give him the wrong reward or rebuke. Okay, well, we know that Jehovah can do that. The Jehovah is almighty, all-knowing, present everywhere. But then Jesus says that about himself. Jesus says, the churches will know that I am the Son of God who searches the hearts and tests the innermost thoughts, the reins, the kidneys, and I will repay everyone according to what they have done. So wait, Jesus, for you to know what every human creature thinks, desires, and does, and to remember what every individual has said, done, thought, and desired to repay them perfectly, you must be omniscient, you must be omnipresent, you must be omnipotent. But wait, Revelation 1.1 1, 1 says you're not omniscient. Because my Joel Witness friend told me, Revelation 1.1 1, 1 says you have to be given revelation. Yeah. Well, yeah. Surprise, David. Daddy, daddy wasn't there to take me to the fair. Where's my Nubian princess? Irie, Irie. Come back to Jamaica, girl. Yaman. Shaba. Come back to Jamaica. What's old is what's new. <laughs> Come back to Jamaica. Remember, I'm dating myself here, guys. I don't think you remember that commercial, right? Oh, Mendez, you are? God bless you. <laughs> no. Who, Guys, I'm dating myself. Do you remember that commercial? Growing up, they used to have a commercial for people to go visit Jamaica. God bless you, Christos. I didn't know that, brother. I thought you were Oriental, right? Come back to Jamaica. There was a commercial. Your new island home. Welcome. Come back to Jamaica. Ah, ah. Shaba. Shaba. Lord willing, get your questions ready. Here's what I'm going to tell you to do. Tomorrow, Lord willing, tomorrow, 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I'm going to do a live Q&A. Write out your questions so you don't forget, and make sure you come with questions. God willing, I'm going to take your questions as the Spirit leads me to. Thank you for the super chat. Thank you, Chu. Thank you, guys, for your support on Patreon and PayPal. You know you are. May the Lord Jesus reward you for partnering with me and my daughters. Guys, pray God will preserve the blessing that he has provided through you for my daughters. Provide for our daily needs. Watch over my daughters and I. Bring them to me sooner than later. So I can raise them up in the love of the Lord. Pray that my health remains until it's time for me to go. And that I get holier for the glory of Christ. And that I continue to teach you for the glory of Christ. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Jesus Christ is Yahovah, God Almighty, the eternal Son of the Father. His heart who became flesh. The eternal companion of the Spirit who will come physically, bodily to the earth to judge the living and the dead. And we pray you come sooner than later, Lord that we're covered by your blood and sealed by your spirit. And I pray that for my daughters and everyone's loved ones here. We need you, Lord Jesus. Thank you. Maranathe. Kiri eleisun, kiri eleisun, kiri eleisun. Father, Son, and Spirit, have mercy. In Jesus' name. Take care.